Could you please tell us about the early followers of Jesus? They called themselves the way. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, they called themselves the way because I called the thing that I was discussing with them the way to God. So that's why that term, that terminology was eventually used to define the people who followed the teachings mm -hmm. that I taught. And um, Claire, you want to know about their personalities and natures or would you like to know about their general condition or what kind of uh, questions? I would involved? love to hear about how their lives were transformed. Right. Their whole being was transformed with a, with a great deal of desire. and. Well, you may be disappointed to hear the answer to that question. <laughs> okay. the, the reality is a lot of the transformations that occurred with the people we knew in the first century at the time did not really occur strongly until after I died. Mm -hmm. And the main reason for that was that while they were listening to me and were fascinated about the truths they were hearing, and there were, was quite a lot of soul-based desire driven by you know, these truths in terms of causing people to be quite fascinated, many of them didn't practice what they learned at all right. until after I passed. And the main reason was because there wasn't a large amount of faith in them about what I was teaching. Mm. So while they could see that my example was quite clear, they could see that obviously something had transformed myself and they could see that I acted differently to every other person mm. I'd ever met, they themselves had not personally experienced many of the things that I was teaching and so they weren't necessarily convinced that they could do it um, they felt strongly that obviously mm. something had happened to me, but and some of them had a feeling that that happened to me because of some kind of unique thing inside of myself, rather than understanding that it was as a result of the things that I was teaching them. So, so up until my death, um, there was a, a number of, or you could say a series of things that occurred uh, up until the point of my death. Around 12 to 13 years before my death, um, so I was in my sort of early 20s at this point. Um, there were some events that happened in my life that caused me to leave my family and to live alone for a period of time. And then, then eventually I went and lived in Capernaum, which was mm. a, a, a part of the, on the, on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, on the, what would you call it now, be the west side of the Sea of Galilee. And that little town, I had a little one bedroom room, if you like, uh, in that town. And I, I began to share divine truth with others, even though I was not yet at one with God. Okay. So, and this is not something that is mentioned in the Bible. So I began to share the divine truth. And as a result of sharing it, very similar things happen to what are happening currently in my life right now. And that is there would be people attracted to the divine truth, attracted to what I'm speaking to them about, attracted to the condition of love that I was in, even though I was not at one with God at that point in time. But uh, of course, they didn't have a strong feeling to embrace the teachings for themselves. They weren't always very passionate about prayer or any of the other things about becoming, to become at one with God. But there was a growing number, a very slowly growing number. So from the time of, my, of 25 years of age onwards around about, there was a slow, slowly growing number of people who were listening. And I would walk around the different towns in the Sea of Galilee and visit different places. I worked fi fixing uh, fishing nets for, mm -hmm. for the fishermen. And so I got to share a lot of the divine truth with lots of different people, people, just yes. average people. In that process, many of them started to put into practice or started to at least attempt to put into practice some things about love that they were learning. And they would talk about it and share about it with others. And so by the time I became at one with God, there was already quite a large following of people who had heard the divine truth. Mm. That being said, um, most of them hadn't personally practiced the divine truth because they couldn't understand the difference between intellectually hearing and understanding and a soul-based awareness and understanding. Mm. So, so there was a lot of confusion about the mm. difference between intellectual and soul-based awareness. And so when I spoke of the different things that transform the soul and receiving divine love, and of course receiving divine love is very much about getting yourself into a state of humility and truth. Many of them weren't humble, particularly oh. to their own emotions. 
yeah. and many of them weren't very truthful in their day-to-day -day life. And so as a result, they would, have, they, they would often be in a lot of argumentative places, even though they were following me around. So even before I became at one with God, you'd have people like Peter and, and, and others, mm -hmm. that, like John, James, who, who knew me before I became at one with God. They'd, have, they'd be following along behind me, having their little arguments and fights about all sorts of issues uh, that they haven't been able to resolve from the t things I was trying to teach them. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, there was large groups of women who were also very interested. Now, it was, it was more difficult for a woman because they couldn't just leave a home or a yeah. family and follow easily unless their husbands were willing to do so. And so for many of the women, they were primarily, they took the opportunities to listen before I became at one with God, before I was baptised. They took the opportunities to listen when I visited their town, but they did not... Um, you know, they couldn't follow around and listen to everything, of course. And, of course, there was no written things written mm. down, very, very little That's written right. down at this point. So, so they could only listen and only hear through word of mouth what mm. was being taught. Now, of course, word of mouth, as you know, mm -hmm. is quite a distorted yes. <laughs> means of uh, <laughs> transmitting information because one person can say one thing and then the emotional filters of the next person filter all of that out and, yeah. and they relay the information. And so quite a lot of the information that people was, were hearing were, was actually a, a distortion already of what mm. I was sharing. Mm. But, uh, but it was their mm. slant, if you like, on what I was sharing. Mm. And this occurred quite a lot as well. Mm. But there were large groups of women, actually, who were interested in divine truth. Sometimes the women were more interested than the men. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and a few of them could follow because some of their men could follow. They had a self-sustenance, uh, enough money to follow somebody around for yeah. a short period of time. So sometimes the women and sometimes the whole family would follow as a result. And, of course, most of that happened on foot or, or on, a, on mm. a beast of some kind, you know, like a donkey or an ass or a horse or whatever. And, uh, and so you'd have people following around. Now, this was all before my baptism, before mm. I went down to the Jordan with John. So during that period of time, a lot of people heard the divine truth. But because I was not yet at one with God, similar to my condition at this point in time, and many, you know, couldn't say for certain that they felt that they could follow it. Mm. They did not have a strong faith themselves, many of them, and so they did not uh, have a strong faith in God or mm. strong faith they exercise with prayer. They did not uh, often believe what I was saying. Mm. Uh, they were fascinated by it but didn't believe mm. it, many of them. And very similar to how most people were acting there today. Yeah, well, actually, the story is quite similar. Yeah, and it was true. It's true. I had not realised that um, in your um, uh, life back two thousand years ago, you did, you were not at one with God the whole time. I thought you no. were born at one with God. Yes, this is a common uh, mm. assumption from for many Christians that I was sort of born at one with God and, and somehow was special all through yeah. my life. Yeah. And while um, some of my experiences were unique with God, obviously, and while there were some unique things that happened uh, with God during my life uh, that hadn't happened to anyone prior, um, it didn't mean that I was some kind of special, unique mm. individual. Mm. It was, uh, uh, well, I, when I say special, unique individual, every person's a special and unique individual. So mm -hmm. I'm like a special and unique individual, the same as you are a special and unique individual. But um, in the sense of having some kind of uh, special connection with God, I had to embrace the desire yeah. for God inside of myself. Yes. I had to desire it by myself, without mm. God's influence. Mm. And this is something that most people are unaware of about mm. my first century life. Mm. Now, my desire for God began quite young. And I, by the time of five, I had a fairly solid desire mm. for God, um, which was much greater than anyone else mm. I knew at the time. And so that was quite unique. And in fact, my parents thought me to be some kind of zealot, you know, some yeah. kind of and, and sometimes they thought I was quite nuts when it came to my <laughs> crazy, when it came to my relationship with God. They didn't understand it well, particularly my father. So he struggled to understand where I was coming from. So, so although he believed I was the Messiah mm. because of certain events that happened during my early childhood, he slowly came to feel that I wasn't the Messiah. 
as I started expressing uh, opinions and ideas that were very different to his own. Yes. Yes. He, he had a very strong concept about what the Messiah would be and my, con my concept of what the Messiah would be, and at that point I didn't think it was me, um, my concept of the Messiah I was looking for was completely different. Mm -hmm. And we often, by the time I was in my teenage years, we often had what you'd probably classify as arguments about yeah. that. Um, my, with my father disagreeing quite strongly and sometimes violently about my opinion. And so by the time I was in my early 20s, I had formulated quite strongly what I believed the Messiah would be, which was very, very different to what my father mm -hmm. believed the Messiah would be. And my mum didn't really know either way. She, yeah. she, she was uh, a yeah. person who, you know, she was watching me develop and obviously she knew something was up. But um, as mums generally do if they're connected with their children, but um, she couldn't really understand it either. And quite often she thought I was crazy too. Mm. So even by the time I was baptised by John, um, my mother still thought that there's something gone wrong with me. Mm. Um, but she loved my nature. She yeah, loved my loving nature. Yes. My father thought there was something completely wrong with me and he didn't love my loving nature. Um, so he, mm. he struggled a bit more. Mm. And of course he was a member of the Sanhedrin yes. by this stage. Yes. So, you know, he struggled on a lot of levels with what I was teaching. Mm. But the general people were um, very similar to the people mm. that Today. we know now who are currently interested in listening to divine truth, but who still are not certain about whether my claims about being Jesus are mm. correct or not. Mm. Um, that, and it was very similar in the first century. I claimed I was a Messiah during this period of time. After around 25 years of age, I was quite comfortable with claiming that publicly. Mm. Uh, even though I was yet to be at one with God. And, um, and people, you know, obviously had their different opinions about that. Mm. Yeah. So in a lot of ways, very, very similar to the reactions that I'm getting right now okay. uh, during those periods of time. Once I became at one with God, of course, uh, things changed quite markedly there. But there was still not a large degree of desire for the individuals who were listening to me to, to develop their own relationship with God. And in fact, on the earth at the moment, many Christians have a much stronger desire to develop their own relationship okay. with God. And many Muslims and many other people do too, by the way, yes. um, than yes. the people who were following me around did. Wow. Yeah. And, um, well, that's heartening, isn't it? Yeah, in some ways. <laughs> yeah. um, it, it also, the difference I feel for many of them in the first century, and we'll talk about yeah. some of the differences maybe in another question, is that there was a strong, there wasn't a strong predisposition of feeling they already knew the truth. Whereas what I find on earth now uh -huh. is in many religions, there is a strong feeling that I have the truth and I cannot accept anything more mm. than what I've already been mm. shared, or, you know, what, what I already feel I know. Now, that wasn't present in most of the people who followed in the first century. There was a huge amount of, in the first century, a huge amount of uh, feelings in the people who followed me that they weren't receiving any satisfaction from the religious teachings that they were currently being taught. Mm. There was mm. no firm definition of what God was like. There was no firm idea about what the spirit world, you know, what happens after you die. Mm. There was no firm idea about the soul. And in fact, there wasn't even a firm idea about the spirit body or anything like that. And so uh, there was a, it was a very physical existence. And as a result of that, these people felt quite dissatisfied in their hearts. And so when somebody like myself came along, it, it was tempting for almost anybody to listen to them for a period of time at least. Uh, until whether you know they felt they could listen no more, or yeah. or whether the, or if their soul was engaged, mm. and if their soul was engaged, their heart was engaged, they would listen a lot, mm. even though they themselves didn't practice what they heard. Okay. So they'd listen because it was fascinating, but many didn't practice what they heard, and and in fact, the majority of these so-called apostles, for example, mm. didn't practice what they heard here mm. either, and didn't do so until way after my death, in many cases. Are they the people that were called the, um, oh, I think of it, um, God-fearers? They weren't committed 
but they were there. Yeah, and they were I would probably call them God of, fearers. Because the, the, the God fearers. I'd call them God, God fearers on a, for a number of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> many, you know, one of the concepts of God that was very prevalent then and still is quite prevalent on the planet now is this concept that you have to be afraid of God. Mm. And uh, so many of them were God fearers in that complete mm. sense that they were very afraid of God. They were quite fatalistic, but also they had this concept of destiny, you know, that some unseen force was, you know, motivating their future destiny, who they believed to be God and, and whom they were quite afraid of because they felt quite negative things happened during their lives, of course, which they blamed on God right. or they blamed on their own uh, dis disobedience with God. Yes. But they, but they weren't clear on how they disobeyed God <laughs> yes. because many of them were following the Torah. They were following mm. what they believed to be God's word at the time and yet bad things were still happening to them mm. so, they, so they couldn't understand mm. how that was happening. So mm. there was a lot of, as I said, a lot of very unclear ideas, mm. uh, but they were God-fearers. But many of them also had this idea that they wanted the truth. They wanted to know there was an openness to the truth. Yes. There yes. was no, a soul-based openness yes. to Schwartz truth, which is very, which I find very similar today mm. in many of the people mm. who are currently listening. Mm. Um, many of the people who are currently listening have a better understanding about a relationship with God than most of the people who were listening in the first okay. century before my death. Okay. Um, you know, there were a few that had a good understanding. Mary, uh, being yes. my wife, had a great understanding. Uh, John the Apostle, what, who's called mm. the Apostle John, he had a pretty good understanding. He was quite sensitive at the soul level. There were others like Cornelius and others mm. who I'm, I met through after I became one with God who gained quite a good understanding um, to a degree mm. before I passed. But, but the majority didn't have anywhere near of a clear concept of what I was talking about mm. most of the time. Mm. <laughs> Hence, they had a lot of fights and arguments <laughs> <laughs> about what I meant you know, yes. as a result. Yes. And those fights and arguments became quite extreme after my passing. Okay. So, so much so that they caused fra f fractioning yes. and fissions in amongst... Is that the reason why many of them would, would just leave and go to India or... Yeah. Yeah, because they couldn't lungers. tolerate the <laughs> belief systems that everybody else had. I see. <laughs> and many also had a strong desire to share truth with others too. That was yes, one. It's true. Once they once they had faith, and the faith came when I appeared to them after my death. Mm -hmm. That for many of them, there was not a strong faith mm -hmm. until that occurred. Like for example, the the um, uh, example of Thomas. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thomas was my brother, and he oh. uh, he was a man who had a lot of doubts about me yeah. because he, he'd grown up with me all of, of my life. So he of saw course. me as a child yes. and he was a younger brother of mine. I, you know, he, was, uh, he was around five or six years younger than I. <sighs> and, but he had a lot of doubts about me as a child mm. because he saw me growing up. He sort of viewed me as a normal child, mm. normal teenager, just someone who had some ideas that were very different. <laughs> and then he heard the divine truth because I spoke about it openly in my family as I was growing up. And, uh, you know, at what you would now classify the dinner table as the <laughs> dinner table. And, uh, and so, you know, he'd heard it most of his life. He was quite fascinated by it. But he also sort of see, saw me as his brother. Like yeah, just, of course. He, he didn't see me as anything unique. And I, was, I didn't feel I was anything unique. But, but when I became at one with God, he could see there was quite a large difference wow. there. And he, he had some faith. But when I died, all of his faith deserted him. Okay. And that occurred to many yeah. of the disciples at the yeah. time. Yeah. They're, at the time of my death, they, it, was, it was to them like the most yes. crushing experience. Yes. Because they sort of felt like everything that I've spoken of was not true anymore. Mm. And it mm. wasn't until I reappeared to them mm -hmm. after my death mm -hmm. um, in different bodies, but they could sense that, I, you know, who I was through what I was speaking. Of course. And that they realised that I was still alive. Mm. And as a result of that, mm. things changed in their faith. Yes. Mm. So...